Friday, August 26, 2022, Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, we're going to refer to uh, Wall Street uh, analysis, uh, macroeconomic analysis that confirms that uh, the end of globalization as we know it will continue to underpin a major commodity bull market for at least a decade, I would say. And that's what we're going to look at today and how that will impact uh, investments and the economy in the West. Before we go into that uh, topic, major topic for the video, we're just going to cover a, a few uh, relevant pertinent stories that have been coming out in the last 24 hours. We've got the UK energy regulator uh, increasing the price cap for uh, gas and electricity for consumers by 80%. And that cap is going to be uh, effective from October. So we're going to go from uh, paying, let's say, for example, 1277 the average household last year in October, to now paying uh, more than uh, twice that that amount, it's going to rise to three and a half thousand. It will probably increase even further. Uh, so I would say that is a symptom of the end of globalization. And, and you will see why when we talk about Zoltan's uh, research, Zoltan po po Polzar. Yes, he's the uh, macro analyst from Credit Suisse who actually used to work at the, the New York Fed and talking about the Fed. Today, we've got uh, the Fed chair, as he's called now. I never knew a chair could speak, but he's going to be speaking at the uh, Jackson Hole Kansas City Fed Symposium. And, and his speech is uh, going to be out at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, Eastern Time, U.S., 3 p.m. London, and uh, it just goes to show how the current system that we have of uh, so-called free market capitalism is no more than central planning by the bankers, because why do we need one man or a group of men and women in a boardroom de deciding where uh, the price of credit, uh, short-term credit, should be for the world. It's just uh, silly. And why should they have the power as well to create this credit out of thin air and uh, put the bill on taxpayers and futurity? Uh, and the, the bill, of course, is inflation, the debasement of the currency. You can see that the, the Fed has debased the fiat dollar by more than 90 percent since it was created in 1913 so we're going to be uh, looking at that today it will impact the markets uh despite the fact that uh yeah it, it's a warped system if you want to call it that so back to globalization and uh <laughs> the current uh globalization period uh, I would say, and Zoltan talks about that, started with the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, 1989. Uh, all the communist regimes in, in Eastern Europe uh, were falling. Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, East Germany. And it's strange because, well, not strange, it's normal that the periphery fell first and eventually the Soviet Union fell a year or two afterwards. And uh, I think at the time, or in 1992, there was an interesting uh, book uh, by Francis Fukuyama, an American uh, author, political scientist. And he said it was the end of history because basically after World War II, we had a bipolar world uh, where the United States uh, was the main power in the West the supposedly free market capitalist West, and you had the, the Soviet Union, the main power in the East, in the Warsaw uh, Pact uh, countries. So it was capitalism versus communism. And uh, it was actually quite a, a stable uh, period of time in terms of uh, wars, because there was deterrence, uh, because of uh, mutually assured destruction or mad because these two major powers had 
a, a lot of nuclear weapons that could uh, obliterate the, the whole world. I, I guess the biggest crisis during uh, that period that could have triggered some major war was the Cuban Missile Crisis back in 1962. Uh, so yeah, that's when the world started shifting to a unipolar world, a, a world where the United States uh, and the capitalist West integrated the rest of the world into their uh, into our sphere of influence. And by our, I don't mean Maneco 64, but I mean the West in general. And uh, we opened, uh, the world was open to uh, trade, uh, to freedom of movement. And China as well, back in um, the beginning of this century, was allowed into the World Trade Organization. So, um, that that that's what globalization was about and Z Zoltan talks about the fact uh, that what this did is it helped uh, the West export inflation and what's exporting inflation mean well it means that our central banks and the general public and governments have been able to borrow and spend uh, to their hearts content for 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 very long uh, central banks have been doing qe we in the west have been taking huge mortgages and 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 consumer credit governments have been spending we've gone from 35 percent of gdp the national uh, debt in the us for example to now like 130 uh, percent national debt in the early 80s prior to the fall of the berlin wall was uh just under a billion when Reagan uh, came into office, and now it's almost 31 trillion. So how did we export this inflation then? Well, as the countries from the East and China and even Latin America and Africa to some extent came into our uh, Western system, into this globalist system, uh, they started uh, developing uh, and we started exporting manufacturing and even services to these uh, countries, call centers, so to speak. And, uh, and they were able to provide us with very cheap goods because uh, their standard, standard of living, standards of living weren't as high as in the West. So uh, a lot of Western companies as well uh, outsourced open factories in these countries, which would have been something unheard of prior to uh, 1989 in Eastern Europe and prior to 2000 in China and the rest of Asia. And uh, yeah, and that kept going, kept going. And I think 2008, of course, was a, a big housing bubble, a big financial bubble, and the whole system almost collapsed financial underpinning of this globalist system and China by then was very uh, relatively powerful already and they realized along with Russia that something was wrong and they've been preparing for the demise I think of this uh, globalist uh, globalization of the world um, and Zoltan goes over this <laughs> this is basically what he's saying uh, so he uh, divides the world in this globalist uh, system. Um, for example, he says that Germany and Europe, for example, benefited from the cheap uh, fuel, natural gas from Russia, and it helped them leverage uh, their manufacturing. But now that's ended. He talks about how the U.S. as well leveraged not just um, its uh, spending, but it leveraged uh, for example, it's borrowing uh, the debt system. It leveraged, uh, allow the banks to print trillions and create trillions out of thin air because they were buying all these cheap goods from China and China and all the rest of the people who were producing things, they obliged by financing this, by uh, taking uh, dollars and euros in return for these goods and buying uh, bonds from these countries. Yes, and, and he's saying now that um, the uh, marriage, for example, between Europe and Russia, that's finished because of, uh, yeah, and, and, and he says that's how marriages go. Sometimes they last long, sometimes they don't. And he's also talking about the marriage between, he calls it uh, 
chimerica that's gone as well. I mean, we the U.S. is still uh, doing a lot of business with China, but uh, the way forward is not good. And he talks about uh, what's happened in Ukraine and even South Korea and Taiwan, even South Korea. Apparently, when Pelosi uh, was traveling a around uh, Southeast Asia or Asia uh, recently, she went to South Korea, but the prime minister there did not meet Pelosi. So even even that is going on there. And uh, so how does that affect commodities? Well, uh, let's have a look here. Um, what Zoltan says, um, we have to go back in the West to having our own production of uh, commodities. We have to have our own supply chains because uh, that's another important part, all the uh, supply chain and trade from, from West to East, the globalization, that's all going to end. And it doesn't look like our leaders in the uh, West and why do I just say our leaders in the West? Well, because I, I, I think the, uh, the East, for example, Russia, China, they wouldn't mind cooperating with the West and the U.S., but uh, it's just too much of a loss of face, I guess, for these globalists in the West. So they're persevering with this divorce and this end of globalization. I mean, yesterday we're hearing uh, from the major leaders in Europe that we're going to have to sacrifice uh, our comforts to fight for freedom. And I don't know what freedom they're talking about. So that shows to me that uh, this is definite. It's going to be a divorce and globalization, as we know, will uh, really not be uh, there. And so, yeah, we're going to have to be uh, commodity intensive, as he says. This is what uh, investors have to be mindful of, according to him. Capital intensive, interest rate insensitive, and uninvestable for the East. And the other thing he says that we need to do in the, in the West, and uh, just to uh, let you know, I agree with his general idea of how things are going to be, but I, I don't agree with him on everything. <laughs> for example, he says that... Uh, the bailout of the banks in 08 because of the financial crisis. The consequences of it was Basel III. <laughs> no, uh, Mr. Pozard, the consequence of it was a lot of money printing and, and, and a lot of, uh, yeah, low interest rates that have basically been a bit of a trigger for this cost of living crisis. It's kind of destroyed the middle class. So it's not just Basel III. I guess he's looking at it from a banker's perspective, but not from a general public perspective. So that's why I don't agree with him. So he, he thinks the West now will have to pour trillions into projects like rearming, which is the military, of course, reshoring, which is basically getting around the uh, blockades like China has blockaded Taiwan. We're not going to be uh, uh, able to be dependent on, on the semiconductors from, from Taiwan, even though we might still get them, and even South Korea, he says. So it's all going to have to come to the West again. Well, and that's going to be expensive, of course, too. And it's going to take time. And he talks about restock and invest. So restock is a that's the commodity part. Uh, we're gonna we're not going to be able to be dependent on rare earth metals, for example, from China anymore, nor gold from Russia and other commodities from from that part of the world. We're going to have to. Uh, yeah, and get to it. We And he says that uh, there's a lot of uh, investment that needs to go into commodities because of this green ESG agenda has basically <laughs> cut a lot of investment in, in real things in the West. And they thought they could depend on the East <laughs> to do the dirty job uh, for us. And now we're going to have to do it ourselves. And also rewiring re the grid. And that's the energy part of it as well. So it's a very interesting paper. And uh, so, yeah, he thinks it's going to be commodity in intensive. So what does that mean? Let's just go through here. I, I don't want to 
take too long, but I think this is important. And you can read this afterwards. Commodity intensity means that inflation will be a nagging problem as the West executes on the above list, rearming, reshoring, restocking, and rewiring. Uh, uh, need a lot of commodities. It's a demand shock. It's a demand shock in a macro environment in which uh, the commodity sector is woefully underinvested, a legacy of a decade of ESG policies. And even um, Tavi Costa, who's a great macro analyst as well, uh, I, I think he, uh, <laughs> he, he'll give uh, Mr. Pozar a run for his money. Uh, he's from Crest Cap Capital, and we've interviewed him a few times here. We've spoken to him. He's been saying this for the last year and a half or two. There's been massive underinvestment in commodities. And that's why I've been telling uh, people, uh, my viewers, for the last two and a half years, may maybe a little longer, that, uh, yeah, there will be a major shift from paper to hard assets. And the reason why the paper won't do as well is because there won't be as much demand from the East, from uh, the globalization uh, game, so to speak. So that's where we stand right now, I think. And um, what I was speaking about earlier, uh, about uh, the price cap being lifted in the UK, that's a symptom of this. Uh, this is just the beginning. It's not going to get better. Um, it, it, all it means is the West, uh, our standards, uh, our standard of living in the West is going to go down. It, it's not the end of the world. All it means is that we're going to really have to work hard for what we get. We won't be able to borrow and spend our way in, in this world like we were able to uh, off the back of globalization, off the back of the, the cheap labor in, in those other countries and also the cheap credit uh, provided by the purchasing of our uh, debt by those countries. So with that, we're going to look at where the markets are this morning. It's uh, 20 to 9 a.m. London time. So we've got spot gold at 17.53.50. And gold as well, of course, is going to be a, a very important part of this. Gold is going to reflect uh, the... Uh, loss of uh, power or loss of uh, reserve major or yeah major reserve status not just of the dollar but the euro and and i talked to you about earlier how the periphery fell first in the uh, warsaw pact soviet world and then uh, a year or two later the soviet union collapsed right and this is what we're seeing now the periphery is falling first uh, the Eurozone, the UK, and eventually will be the US. And when that happens, uh, the price of gold will reflect that in that it will be a lot higher versus all the major currencies in the West. So the high has been 1760 overnight and the low 1752 right around where we are right now. Silver is pretty much unchanged around 1922. Uh, the Dow futures is down 77 or a quarter of a percent. NASDAQ 100 futures down 50 or 0.4 and the S&P 500 futures down 13 or a third of a percent. I also think that uh, the stock market, it won't be plain sailing uh, as we've uh, had for the last 30 years, mainly because the discount rate to uh, price financial assets will be higher than it has been because there won't be financing, the financing from the East or from the global South or BRICS, if you want to call it, is not going to be there. So that will mean higher rates. And that's why I think uh, the stock market will also not do very well uh, in relative terms, especially versus commodities. Uh, the FTSE uh, 100 index is up 25 points at 7508. Euro stocks is up 17. 36.91. Uh, to the currencies, uh, sterling uh, is down half a percent, 117.78. The euro is unchanged at 99.67. Dollars up 0.4 of a percent at 137.07 versus the Japanese yen. 
And the dollar is up slightly versus the Swiss franc at 96.50. Uh, dollar is up a quarter versus the Chinese yuan at 686.93. And uh, the dollar is uh, down slightly here versus the uh, ruble at 59.40. To the other currencies, uh, Aussie dollar is down a third of a percent, 69.50. Uh, the dollar is up a quarter of a percent versus the Canadian dollar, 129.50. And the Kiwi dollar is down uh, 0.7 of a percent at 61.89. Quickly look at the uh, general commodities. WTI crude is up 1.2 percent, uh, 93.57. And uh, as for globalization and crude oil, I think OPEC plus one, which is the uh, OPEC countries plus Russia, they're going to shift uh, a lot more to this uh, BRICS Global South uh, uh, polarity, if you want to talk about that, <laughs> with the breakup of globalization. So I, I think the, the price of oil is going to be a lot higher on average for the next uh, few years or decade. So that's how the way I see crude oil as well. Uh, Brent crude is up 1.2%, uh, trading just below 100 at 99.80. High grade copper is up half a percent at 371.60. US snack gas is up 2% at 952. Uh, let's look at the uh, Dutch nat gas or European nat gas. Well, that's trading at 305, <laughs> which is a massive uh, price. Uh, prior to 2020, uh, the average price was uh, around 10 to 15, and now it's trading at 305. It is down on the day, though, down about 5%. We'll finish off with the uh, bond markets. We'll first look at the uh, UK uh, gilt market. A couple of days ago, we got to that very close to that 270 level uh, on the 10 year. Right now, we're up two basis points, around 264. If we break through that level, I think we could see a rapid acceleration uh, in, in yields uh, in the UK. To the US Treasury market, uh, we've got the two-year up two basis points. We're almost at 340. So that's, that's picked up quite a bit in the last... Uh, few days and the 10 year is up five basis points at 307 so the curve is comfortably uh inverted still and i expect to see a lot of volatility this afternoon uk time uh with the uh speech from uh, jay powell so if you enjoyed this video make sure you hit the like button please share it far and wide think about subscribing uh, to my channel if you haven't yet and with that, I wish you all a great day and a great weekend. Take care. Bye.